Well, welcome to another lovely location here in southern Utah. We're looking south at the Henry Mountains. We're a few miles uh, west of the town of Hanksville, just north of Highway 24. And the main thing we're going to focus on in this video is this unit, which forms these kind of candy striped hills, um, just really kind of Mars almost like landscape when you think about it completely devoid of vegetation. I think we're going to wander around here a little bit and see what kind of things we can find. Uh, thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Um, out here exploring the geology, explaining it as best I can to you, and hopefully getting you excited about these landscapes, their stories, and also maybe, you know, um, tempting you to come out and visit some of these places yourself. So before we go into this in too much detail, I think I want to start with the regional context of this area. We're looking at rocks here, geologic units, that are from about 150 million years ago, a time called the Jurassic period. So let me start with my paleogeographic map here, um, put together by a former professor of mine, Ron Blakey, uh, from the Nor Northern Arizona University. So during the Jurassic period, we had some interesting things happening. Here's North America. Here's the Atlantic Ocean opening as South America and Africa move away. But more importantly, here in the West, we had uh, a little incursion of the sea coming down from the north. We had big volcanoes along the west coast of the U.S., and we had river systems flowing into this little arm of the sea. Let me flip this over to a little more detailed view of the region. So here is Utah right here. So we are located about here on this map. And you can see these river systems on this paleogeographic map flowing out to the north towards that little uh, arm of the sea, what we sometimes call the Sundance Sea. Uh, big dune fields here, shown in the, the lighter kind of yellow color. And then the big mountains, including volcanoes, because we had a subduction zone where one plate was diving beneath the other, forming these volcanoes here. And this is important to our story. The Morrison Formation is the unit we're in right now. So this is this uh, geologic layer that's about 150 million years old. And as you can see shown on the paleogeographic map here, it's a lot of river systems, uh, sandstones, um, some mudstones, conglomerates, these river systems moving off to the north, joining that uh, Sundance Sea, uh, that incursion of the sea coming out of what's now Canada. Uh, but at the same time, we had these eruptions of ash from these big volcanoes here on the coast, and that ash would spread over this short distance into this low area, and that ash would actually fall out of the sky and form deposits of ash during this time period. So that actually helps us learn a little bit more about what's happening here. Um, let me grab my rock hammer. And you can see that these hills, these banded, colorful hills, are completely devoid of vegetation. And sure, we're in uh, a desert, but just not too far away, there's some plants growing in this material, but not so much here. And that's because these candy-striped hills, these multicolored units, when we get in here and look at these up close, they are basically made out of a very, very fine material, a type of clay called uh, bentonite. There's actually several different types of clay. There's smectite and montmorillonite and bentonite, uh, but let's call it bentonite for now. And this is a type of clay that actually shrinks and swells. So as it gets wet, it actually expands and swells, but when it dries out, it actually shrinks or um, uh, gets a little bit smaller. And this makes it very difficult for plants to grow in this type of material. So it leaves these hills completely devoid of any vegetative material. And these clays in the Morrison Formation were derived originally from that same volcanic ash we talked about that was erupting from those large volcanoes along the west coast. So volcanic ash is somewhat unstable over periods of geologic time. And what it does is it breaks down into clay minerals. So this, 
these clay hills that we're seeing here with all these beautiful colors was originally volcanic ash that has been altered and changed to form the bentonite clays we see here. This is a unit called the Morrison Formation, named after the town of Morrison in Colorado. It's known for its dinosaur fossils in some places. This specific portion of the Morrison Formation is called the Brushy Basin member, and it kind of has always these, uh, these striped clay-rich uh, mudstones and um, yeah, volcanic, altered volcanic ash deposits. But in other places, the Morrison Formation uh, has sandstones and conglomerates, and I think those are the units where the dinosaur fossils are found, not so much in these altered volcanic ashes. So I'm gonna wander around a little bit more. I think there's some other cool things to see here at this site. So we'll pick it up from our next little stop here in the Morrison Formation in Southern Utah. Okay, so we can see this hill here made out of these uh, banded layers of that altered ash we talked about, the, the bentonite, the clay. But capping the top there is um, some harder, more resistant units of a different color. And we can see that some blocks of that unit have fallen down here onto the landscape. And in places, what it forms is a really uh, nice little, what we call toadstool, or I guess you'd call it a little balance rock feature like we have right in front of me here, where we have the band in, banded uh, bentonite layers, the soft mudstones and clays, and then capping it is a much more resistant unit that is made out of sandstone. So this is actually sandy. Uh, this is a, a, a river deposit. So this would be along riverbanks, um, would be, uh, you can see actually on top of it, can't quite get up there, but you can see some of the gravels cemented into it. So this would be a river channel deposit. Um, so the Morrison Formation has, you know, these low areas where the volcanic, volcanic ash fell altered into clay, but also moving through the region, you would have river systems with gravels in their beds and sands uh, along their banks. And that forms these more resistant hard units here. So you can see this little toadstool, this little balanced rock, um, the cap rock of coarse sandstone is protecting this pedestal from further erosion. Eventually, of course, will collapse um, as more of the erosion occurs along the base, uh, but then the process will probably just more or less start over as the capstone of hard gravel and sandstone protects the underlying uh, mudstone over time. Um, let's walk over this way as well and look at some of these big blocks of the sandstone and conglomerate that have come down and see if we can make any inferences or interpretations about them. So this is almost the, the start of one of these little balanced rock things here. You can see this, this rock here is being protected. Um, it's protecting the little pedestal it's starting to, to grow on. So who knows, in a few more thousand years, that could look like a lot like the other little toadstool rock we just looked at. So a couple of big blocks over here. Um, and what these should show, a lot of times in these channel deposits in rivers, is we oftentimes see cross bedding uh, that forms along the base of them. So we can see some of the little pebbles embedded in this kind of coarse sandstone or conglomerate here. Let's see if we can find any of the cross bedding that's often preserved in these. Might be in one of these bigger blocks here. Can you see some of the rounding of the material as well? Oh, here we go. This kind of nicely shows, this is a block that's fallen, but you can see these angled lines in the cross bed as the river channel has changed position. Think about a meandering stream and how over time the meandering stream uh, will change its position uh, throughout time. So yeah, just a nice little coarse grained 
sandstone, I guess we could call the conglomerate. We've got some small pebbles of, uh, looks like a lot of chert, quartzite, the usual kind of hard resistant rocks that we would expect to see. So we'll wander around a little bit more and see if we can find some other neat little aspects or treasures here in the Morrison Formation. So along some of these uh, benches, there are what I would call lag deposits, which means harder rocks that have been weathered out of existing rocks. And then as this soft mudstone beneath erodes, they, they sort of just stay on top and just, they lag behind because they're on a flat bench and they're not in the gullies where the erosion can wash them away. But as I kind of was just hunting through this area, um, I'm no rock hound by any means in terms of understanding or being able to um, correctly label all the fancy terms used in rock hounding. But as I'm looking at some of these rocks strewn about here, uh, some of them to me, based on what I know, are what I would call uh, agates, these sort of reddish um, versions of cryptocrystalline quartz. Uh, there's some there. Uh, there's some that are maybe a little bit more like chalcedony in terms of their, their color. Um, and let's see what else we have up here. Here's a bigger piece of what I think I would call agate based on the color. I'm sure someone will comment and correct me if I'm wrong. The other thing we can see in all these rocks, well most of these rocks, is they have this very dark varnish on them. This is desert varnish and what's kind of interesting sometimes is that the color that the rock presents itself with, if you break it open, uh, now that one's an igneous rock so it's pretty similar in color. That's like a, that looks like it came from the Henry Mountains, some of the diorite that we see there. Um, but it, others of these, if you break them open, they might be light colored on the inside. So this dark varnish is just uh, literally a coating. There's one. I chip away there and you can see the lighter color underneath of this. Uh, looks, this looks like maybe a, a chert. Let's see if we can break it open a little bit more. Um, so that's kind of interesting is that the outward color of the rocks is not always indicative of the true color. There's a little bit more chipped away there, but you can see, yeah, this looks like a chert to me. You can see some of the lighter color there and just this thin black coating on the outside, this desert varnish. Um, yeah, so some of these uh, deposits, somewhat interesting to me. So we'll keep looking around though. Okay, I've just moved a little bit further to the west of the last couple of sections of the video, and we can see some of these massive blocks of coarse grain sandstone and conglomerate that have come down that were once capping the ridge. We can still see them capping the ridge there, uh, but as we look up at this banded hill here, uh, they're not there anymore. So presumably they've tumbled down and they formed some of these big boulders we see here. This, this boulder in particular here, I can back up and get it all in, uh, is, is really massive. It's maybe, you know, a tiny house size, maybe 12, 14 feet tall, uh, three, four meters, something like that. Uh, and sure enough, you can see it's composed of these very gravel rich layers that would have been uh, in the channel of the riverbed during times of higher flow, possibly floods. This little section of this boulder here nicely illustrates the the changing in the energy levels. We've got a, a conglomerate rich layer here at the bottom with pebbles, then a dominantly sandy unit here, and then again another gravel rich layer above it. So this would indicate, you know, higher pulses of energy where we can deposit and move the gravel sized particles, and then a drop in energy where the only material moved by the river was sand size particles, and then another pickup and increase in energy to deposit those larger uh, gravel sized particles there. You can also get a sense of how big the flood is by looking for the largest particle. This one's maybe 
uh, maybe two and a half inches, what would that be in centimeters? Uh, maybe five or six centimeters in diameter. So it gives you a sense of how much water uh, and the power of the water to move the particles. Uh, but just a really delightful little scene here in the brushy basin member of the Morrison Formation, a Jurassic Age unit in not just Southern Utah, but in the Four Corners area, one of the more scenic units in this region. Thanks for joining me. I think we'll conclude here and I'll head back to the car. Uh, and thanks for sticking it, sticking, sticking it out with me because sometimes I come into these areas and do these videos and I've got a, maybe a little bit more of a script in my head or a plan. And so they seem a little bit more polished. And then sometimes like today, you know, I brought a graphic with me and I knew what unit this was, but I'd never been here before. And so basically you're learning on the fly and discovering things with me, which I think is still an exciting way uh, to learn and to do these. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, thanks for supporting these videos. Remember, you can always like, share, subscribe. That's helpful. Um, donate button on the banner of the my YouTube page. Uh, thanks button, which will let you donate below the video on the right. And then under the video description, there's links as well uh, there for you to donate uh, if you'd like to. It helps me get to these locations pay for the gas, uh, buy some food, that sort of thing. So appreciate all your support, appreciate your patronage and watching this YouTube channel and the videos I share with you. So for now, uh, signing off from scenic Southern Utah, the Henry Mountains and the Morrison Formation, just east of Capitol Reef National Park.